Hi everyone, I'm Amy Johnson Crow. As genealogists, we work with a lot of records, but sometimes we come up against some record custodians that aren't exactly being open with their records. Well, I'm talking today with Brooke Schreier Gans, who is the president and founder of Reclaim the Records, an organization that is doing some great work to get these records that are supposed to be available to the public actually out to the public. Brooke, thanks for being here. Thank you for what, having me. <laughs> what, what got you started? And tell us a little bit about Reclaim the Records and what got you started in this project. Well, sure. You know, I, um, I'm not a professional genealogist. I'm just a serious hobbyist, like a lot of people are. I don't take clients, but I've been researching my own family since 1998, so a long time. I, I discovered it in college because it was a great way to procrastinate on studying for my finals. Nice. Yes. That, that's, that's the first time I've ever heard somebody <laughs> using genealogy as a way to, to not yes. study. That's great. Yes. But specifically, the way I discovered it was I discovered websites that had databases. And so I sort of came into genealogy with the, of course, untrue assumption that stuff is online or is about to go online and ought to be online. and that was the default setting. And when I discovered that, of course, many records were not online at all, that yeah. sort of influenced my thinking. Um, I grew up in New York. My whole family's from New York. All eight of my great-grandparents lived in New York City. Um, five were born there, three immigrated through Ellis Island. Basically, all the records I want in the US are New York related, either New York City or New York State. They're two okay. separate vital records jurisdictions. New York City is treated like its own state, kind of, Okay. when it comes to how they manage their records release policies, things like that. Uh -huh. It's a little weird. Um, but then I met a guy also in college, and uh, we eventually got married, and I moved with him to his home state, which is California. So I was a New Yorker in exile in California, and all, and all the records I wanted to do my research with were across the country. And as the years went on, I thought, well, we'll go online eventually. Well, I could go visit there, but then I had kids, and I was home, and eventually I kind of noticed they're not putting anything online. Yeah. You know, and every state has their own rules about what they want to put online, what they would like to if they had more budget, what they would like to if they wanted to. And New York is surprisingly known as a black hole for genealogy. Mm -hmm. Some states are so much better. They will release the index. They will scan the old certificates. They will work with the historical society. New York City, New York State, not like that at all, at all. And it was very surprising and very frustrating. Mm -hmm. And that frustration built and built. And I was trying to do my research. And it's still a long-term hobby of mine. But I'm across the country thinking, kind of don't want to fly across the country to go to the archives. And I have two little kids now. I can't leave the house. Well, why, why won't they put it online? What's, what's taking them so long? Mm -hmm. And every other state was coming along nicely. And New York and New York State and New York City were not really doing deals for even basic vital records indexes, just the index of what they had. Right, so, so we're not even talking about, you know, getting the records online. Oh, no. They weren't even putting an index to the records online. Exactly, and it was so frustrating because it was there was one little index here and there that had been created by volunteer groups, not by the government, but by volunteer genealogists working at home off Excel spreadsheets, you know, really people's time, time and effort put in, not the government's though. Right. And it built to the point where in 2015, in January 2015, as my New Year's resolution to myself, I thought there has to be a better way. There has to be some way to get an index online. Maybe they just don't have the money or the time. What if I request an index, just a very simple index. I'll start with an old one so they have less reason to say no. Right. And I will get the index myself. I will digitize it myself and get it online. I have a tech background. Right. Maybe that'll work. And maybe they'll actually even be happy. I was naive. Um, <laughs> So for in January 2015, my New Year's resolution was no more Mr. Nice Guy, no more like begging these records to go online, which everybody had been begging. Let's be right. clear here. Right. Major companies like Ancestry, um, nonprofits like Family Search, smaller nonprofits, local groups, just mm -hmm. nothing was getting through. Right. They're like, no, you can come see it at the archives. That's it. Yeah. And, you know, we can come here, but that. So I created a freedom of information request. And it turns out what I had learned and sort of taught myself out of my frustration was there are different state-level freedom of information laws. Okay. They might be called the Sunshine Law, mm -hmm. they might be called the Open Records Law. Utah's law has the best name, they're called GRAMA, G-R-A-M-A, it's an acronym. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, so someday I want to use like Grandma's Law to get Grandma's record. Yeah. <laughs> um, and New York had a law called just the Freedom of Information Law, F-O-I-L. Okay. This is not the same as the federal one, FOIA, which a lot of people have heard of. Mm -hmm. FOIA is just for the federal agencies, but they're the state-level ones too, they're just not as famous. So right, you, but, but, these, but these states do have actually codified 
yes. laws of what records are supposed to be available right. to the public. And they're all like a little different from here to right. there. Some cover the judiciary, some don't, some cover the legislature, some don't. But I didn't care about those records. Right. I was thinking, well, shouldn't you cover records in a government archive? These are government created records in a government archive. Our taxes paid for them. Taxes back in the day created to were used to create the records originally. They're not private. Um, and if I were there, I could see them. So there's no privacy restriction. What's the problem? Right. And I didn't know any genealogist who had ever done something like this. So, so, you, so, so you're trying sort of a, a, a legal requirement that these should be open. Exactly. Now, the law says that the, unless it's explicitly named as something that's too private, the assumption is it's open. And there was no legal requirement saying this, like your, your archive records are closed. These are very old. Right. So I sent a freedom of information law request, which basically means an email to the New York City Municipal Archives. Which so we're, we're talking New York City here. I started with New York City. I thought as much as I wanted this for my own genealogy, I was thinking kind of long term. So I thought, let me specifically go for something with a limited scope, limited years, very old, already open to the public if I were in New York, which I'm not. So I made a lot uh, the email. Just an email is all you really need. Making one of these requests is free. Right. And very little in genealogy is free, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So I made a request saying, hi, I would like a copy of this record set, uh, the New York City Marriage License Index. Just the index to the licenses, not an, even an actual license. They, they just, hope, just the index. Just to see, does my relative exist in there as having gotten married? And I thought that the archives would be thrilled if the index went online because if I wanted to order the actual marriage license, I would order it from them and they would get right. revenue for that. That revenue goes to them. They weren't so thrilled. They said, no, you cannot have a copy. Sure, they're public records in the sense that you can come here and use them. But that's not what the law requires. And yeah. I was very frustrated. I appealed. Mm -hmm. They didn't follow the rules for handling an appeal. They said um, they didn't send a copy to the Committee on Open Government, which is the watchdog group for the state set up by the judiciary. I mean, sorry, by the legislature. And I felt very frustrated. And I thought, what do you do? And unfortunately, what you have to do sometimes is do them. And that's what I did. So I found an attorney. And that was actually one of the hardest parts because I didn't right. know anything about this. I am not an attorney. My parents wish I were. <laughs> <laughs> um, my father is a lawyer. My sister is a lawyer. My uncle is a lawyer. I was kind of expected to be a lawyer too. And I didn't go that route. I chose tech instead. Right. And now I was thinking maybe I should have been a lawyer because this could have been a lot easier. <laughs> but I did find an attorney. I explained to him my case and he said, okay, well, you know, this seems like it's an open and shut thing. Yeah. So we had to file against the municipal archives. And at this point, this is just still me. This is still individual, frustrated, very frustrated genealogist. Right. But I thought, sue New York City, that's that's a big deal. That's a little scary. Um, yeah, that's that's really fighting City Hall right. in a big way. Right. And I thought, you know what? I need a posse. I need a group to do this with me. But I didn't have a group, so I invented one. So I created a website called reclaimtherecords.org, and the group is Reclaim the Records. And at the point, it was just a website with an email list and some social media. Mm -hmm. That way, because it now existed, I was able to sue New York City, Brookshire Gans, and reclaimtherecords.org versus the Department of Records and Information Services, which is the parent organization of the municipal archives. Okay, okay. And we sued them, which means we brought, we're technically speaking, it's not a lawsuit, it's a freedom of information law article 78 case in the supreme court of new york so we were <laughs> we were the petitioners i think they're right we weren't a plaintiff we were a petitioner okay, okay. so we weren't saying like you know you did some, we're saying basically you didn't follow your own law right. and they settled they suddenly settled we were supposed to see them on court on a friday i was not actually even going to be there and that monday they called up my attorney and said if we give her what she wants will she go away <laughs> and he said yes and they said okay settled the case it was not that expensive at all, and a couple of weeks later, I got 48 brand new microfilms in a box sent to me in California. Suddenly, they're sitting on my kitchen table. I thought, oh my gosh. The, I, the, the marriage license index yes. for the city of New York. Yes, for those what, specific years. For those specific years. Yeah, and the thing is, when you have the freedom of information law, you can't make a government agency make an index for you. They can't right. make any new work or any right. new type of file. Right. Right. Whatever they have, you can get a copy of. And so usually people say they have paper so I could get scans for 10 cents a scan or right. something. Right, right. But it turns out New York City only ever had microfilms. They never index it themselves, so they had microfilms that you could use at the archives. So I got a box of brand new microfilms Film. created from the master copies, which are nicer than the ones at the archives, and that's what they sent to me for $35 a film plus $50 shipping to California. Right. 
Wow. So that was the start. And and it was and it was <coughs> just making them follow the their law. own their own laws. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and the you're... and the procedures for that that were already exactly. in place. It was it was trying to explain to them, no, really, the Freedom of Information Law covers your government archive and just because you've never had a request like this doesn't mean it's not true. Right. At any point they could have checked with an attorney. They had free attorneys um, at the Committee on Open Government who could have told them the same thing. I had an advisory opinion in hand to show them, look, they say you're you're supposed to follow this. They didn't care. Yeah. And sometimes you know, we all love our archivists, we love our archives, but sometimes they are not going to give up what they want unless you fight them. Yeah. And they're not going to give up what they have unless you fight them. And right. that's what it took. But that one case broke the dam. As scary as it was, the municipal archives now can't hold back for anybody. So right. not just for me or for my organization, but other genealogists have been coming to them too. Um, people who I had never known before have right. emailed me and said they had things at the municipal archive they had been longing to get copies of. Now they know they can email them or call them and say, I want a copy of the such and such microfilms or the such and such papers. I know you have them. You have to give me copies. Yeah. I'll pay you for the copies. It's not free. Right. But, and, and, yeah. and I think that that's, that's important to recognize. You know, you didn't get those 48 rolls of microfilm for free. No. You yeah. know, you're, you're paying what their rate is. Right. But it's just making them follow their own rules, their own, exactly. their own procedures. So, so you, you have that victory. I, with with the with the New York City archives, right? And that was 2015, and I thought this is great. So I have a box of microfilms on my table now. It's like, well, I've gotten them out. I've, I've cracked it, and I have these new records that have never left New York City before. Never been on Family Search, not on Ancestry. What do I do now? They're in microfilm formats. Well, what I did is I emailed David Rencher, who I didn't know at all. Um, now, for Family now, Search. For, for the, I was going to say for for those of you who don't know, uh, David Rencher is the chief genealogical officer for Family Search. He he's the he's the top dog. Oh, so yeah, she went right to the top. Grand high muckety muck. And I didn't yeah. know him at all, but I got an email through a friend, and I was very very polite in the email. What I said to him actually was, "Would you like these brand new microfilms for Family Search so that so somehow they'll get online now? Because I know you have scanning equipment. This way you can scan a copy, mm -hmm. put it on Family Search, and they'll be free." And there'll be a copy in the Grand Mountain Vaults. They won't just be in New York City, which is a terrible idea to have everything centralized just in New York City. And he was so nice. He wrote me back and said, sure, we'd be happy to, to put them on our website, but why don't we scan them for you for free, send you back the microfilms and a free hard drive with all the images. And he did. I shipped it to Salt Lake City, and they covered the cost of shipping, and they scanned everything, and they sent it back, and I got a hard drive full of images. Okay, so now I've gotten to the point where I have them digitized, but they're still not online right. other than potentially going on family search someday. Right. So I need to find a place to put them. And I realized there's so many images here because there were hundreds of images per roll of film. Right. It's gonna actually cost a lot of money if I buy a server and set it up, which was, had been my original plan. Maybe I could crowdfund it, I wasn't sure. But then I realized I could upload them to the internet archive. Archive.org. Archive.org. Archive.org, the Internet Archive is a nonprofit library based in San Francisco, and they let anybody upload anything to their website. You can upload, um, you know, they have books for available for, for download or for, for reading online. They have TVs, TV shows, they have music, they have software. I uploaded the images for free. I don't have to pay the software, right. uh, I'm sorry, the server costs, and it was awesome. Suddenly you could just flip through all these images online. You yeah. don't have to be in New York. You don't have to be awake from 9 to 430. So wow. and that was the start. And so I had a pipeline now. The pipeline was find the record set, make a freedom of information request. If they don't allow it to go forward, sue them, get the records in the regular format, send them to Family Search, have them be digitized if needed. Sometimes you don't need that. And that's always at Family Search's discretion, mm -hmm. I've always said, you know, if you never want to say no, that's all right. But they yeah. have been so generous and so kind to scan these things. Mm -hmm. Get back the digital copies, put them on the internet archive, rinse, repeat. <laughs> and that's nice. it. And those records will never be locked up again. They will always exist on the internet. Right. So, so what are some of the other victories that oh. you have had? I know you've you've had a couple big ones here yes. lately <laughs> in some in a in a really tough state. Yes, we've had a couple that were were very tough. So we went on from there and just it started snowballing. I repeated it with other record sets. I started moving on to other states, and we incorporated it as a nonprofit last year. 
Um, we actually got our IRS tax, you know, registered with the IRS to become a, a nonprofit organization, a 501c3. And we are just doing this more and more in other states and other cities that have had the same problem with these records being locked up. Right. So we did a lot more in New York because that was my original interest. We went after the New York State Death Index, which had only been available on microfiche in a limited number of New York State libraries in upstate and one location in Nara in Manhattan. And we got copies of all of those, scanned them. It took us 17 months of fighting with the New York State Department of Health. We did not have to sue them, but we did have to bring in our attorneys several times to write angry letters to them for things they were doing that were breaking the law, which we had to point out to them. Um, they tried to charge us $152,000. They tried to tell us there was $152,000 for an index. And index. Here's how they came up with that. Rather than saying, here is the exact number of microfiche sheets, and it will cost, say, a fraction of a cent to, to scan them, and therefore multiply that, and here's your cost, they just said, we're going to guess that there's $2,000 per year, and we're going to pretend it's the same cost for every single year, even though other years obviously have more deaths than other years. And so $2,000 times the number of years, it's $152,000. Furthermore, we, the New York State Department of Health, have decided that you need to give us 50% of this as a down payment in the next 10 business days, otherwise we're going to cancel your request. And at that point I called my attorney and said they're trying something that's not legal. Yeah. And again, these, these organizations and agencies, they're not used to people pushing back. They're not used to genealogists and genealogy organizations being, no, you can't do this. I'm not asking you for the records. I'm telling you what your requirements are under the law. Right. So we pointed out to them, there's no such thing as an, exploit an exploding offer in FOIL. You have to give us the actual cost based on the actual number of records. And after 17 months, they finally came around. So that was the New York State Death Index, millions of records, all online now. Um, we got uh, the New York City Marriage Index for later years, 1930 to 1995. We got the Buffalo, New York Death Index, 1840 something, 1852, I believe, to 1944. We got the New Jersey Marriage Index, 1901 to 2016. New Jersey. New Jersey. New Jersey. And actually, I want to talk about that because that was not one that I initiated. Uh -huh. What I love about doing Reclaim the Records is teaching other people, other genealogists who love this, how they can file these requests. It's not that hard. You don't always get you know, such resistance. Sometimes New, New Jersey has been great to deal with, usually. Really? Yeah. Be and because, it, because honestly, New Jersey has a really tough reputation of being you know, a, a hard state to get records out of. So well, I, I'm surprised to hear that. Well, the archives have been wonderful. It's been the Department of Health that has been uh, hard to deal with. So here's what happened. Uh, another genealogist who was sort of worked with us and been inspired by our work decided, well, if she can do that, I can do that too, which is the point. You can do this too. So he wrote a letter, and in New Jersey's law, it's not called FOIL. It's called OPRA, not like OPRA, but O-P-R-A, <laughs> Open Public Records Act. That's New, Jer New Jersey's version of their state law. And so their state law, he wrote a request saying, I would like a copy of all of your, the indexes to your marriages. Your marriage records, yes, they have privacy protections, but it says that you are required to keep an index for every county that has more than 5,000 people in it, which is all the counties. Right. He went and he read the law. You just have to really dig in and find that website, which is ugly and you know, hard, hardly updated, but find the actual law and see what, Index was not a word that was restricted. Certificates and licenses are restricted. The index is not, almost right. never. And he put this forward to New Jersey. And initially, New Jersey Department of Health said no, no. But New Jersey is one of those states that has mediation available. And so when he was about to move to mediation, that's when he contacted me and he said, hey, um, I kind of did this thing on my own. I kind of need some help now. Will you help? And I said, yes, this is what our organization should be doing. Right. So we hooked him up with our attorney and we were raising the money. We knew we'd be able to help him afford the records if he won. But it turned out at the last minute, New Jersey had an assistant attorney general who reviewed the case before mediation started. And mm -hmm. she was just great. She's like, yeah, these are fine. You can just have them. And she yeah. sent him a hard drive. Or I, I believe she even like gave it to him on Google Drive or something like that. Wow! Just gave him the records, and yeah. that was it. No court case. We had the records. Just now. had just had to make the request. Right. So for for someone who is who is in a state where they they suspect that this set of records should be open, or mm -hmm. at least this index should be open and available to everyone, how do they get started? Okay. Good question. So. 
let me explain what happened to me when I wanted to get a state I knew nothing about, um, which is Missouri. Somebody recommended it to me saying, you know, I love what you're doing in New York. Can you look at other states? Can you look at Missouri? There is no Missouri birth index post 1910, at least not one that's public. Um, Missouri death certificates are public if they're more than 50 years old and people do make indexes from it, but there's not a more modern death index. Right. So I thought, well, let me see what the law says. That's what you should do first. Look up the law. And there, I mean, by this two laws, one is the state's vital records laws. Just Google name of your state, vital records law, vital records act, find the actual state laws that are online somewhere, probably in a very ugly format. And then also look up your state sunshine law name, or it could be the okay. sunshine law, it could be um, open public records law. There are websites that help. There's a website called Ballotpedia that will have all 50 states plus DC, all their individual laws with links. And there are other organizations out there will help you explain them. Many of them are free. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they're journalist related because their journalists use these laws a lot. Right. But they will explain, they have websites like here are the things that this particular state exempts that other ones don't. Here's what this one's a little quirky about that they're kind of all the same. And you can just read them, they're online. And it's always free to file. You just file with the government agency that holds those records and mm -hmm you cite why you think they're not legally held back. There's no privacy restriction because, fill in the blank here, mm -hmm. I want to copy from this to this, try to have a date on both ends to make it as specific as possible so okay. they can't, they, they will try to mess it up. So try to make it as specific as possible why you want them from so, what they So don't are. just say, I want a copy of the, the birth record <coughs> index that you have, say, looking for the, the birth records index from 1900 to 1920. Something like that. Something and, like and that. And if you know for sure that they're already on file, say, at a historical, or not historical society, at a government-run repository okay. of some sort, like a, a city or county archive, something like that, or right. a state library, you can cite that to them exactly. Like, it's already on file at such and such. I could use it if I'm there, but I'm not there. Can I have a copy? I, and you have to say, I will pay you for the copy. You have to make that offer to pay. In a small number of states, you might need to say, I am an individual genealogist, or I'm a Nonprofit. I am not a for-profit company. So just stick that line in. Right. Um, and that's about it. And you send it off to whoever their Freedom of Information Records Access Officer is, or Oprah Records Access Officer is. Right. They have to get back to you in a couple of days. Every state's a little different. Like a week or two usually is fine. Right. They probably won't. They'll probably be late. If they go more than a month, that's when you move forward and you contact them again. Call them if you have to. You harass them, honestly, to say, hi, you were supposed to be answering these requests in X number of days. You have not done that. Um, can you help me with this, please? You don't have to, you have to be nice, at least in the beginning, right. but firm, because you're not asking for a favor. You're telling them what they're responsible to do as a government employee under their state law. And that's right. the attitude. That's what makes things happen. Right. So it's being very clear about your request, yes. state that, that you are willing to pay, that you yes. are an individual, or if you are with a nonprofit, right. that, that that's, um, but just be very specific about that, cite that it's already available in a government agency right. repository, so like a like like you say, a, a state archive, a state library, right. a, a county archive or something like that. Right. And then just keep following up and And if you run into problems, contact Reclaim the Records and we'll be happy to help you. <laughs> Excellent. So if people do need to get in contact with you or want to read more about this awesome project, where can they find you? They can find us online. We're all over the internet. So if there's multiple- Wait, online? Yes, completely. <laughs> <laughs> so you can find our website at Reclaim the Records, that's plural, reclaimtherecords.org. Um, we're also on Facebook, like look for Reclaim the Records. We're also on Twitter at Reclaim the Rex. Records was too long. We're available in all three versions. On our website, we have the ability to sign up for our email list. We really only send email about once every six weeks. We're not trying to bother people too much. On Facebook and on Twitter especially, we are much more active. We answer questions quicker that way. You can also email me at info at reclaimtherecords.org. Excellent. Brooke, first, thank you for everything that you're doing and what Reclaim the Records is doing. Thanks. And thank you for answering my questions today. This Anytime. has this has been great. Everybody go check out reclaimtherecords.org and if you want to find out more about genealogy and how to find your family history, please subscribe here either to my YouTube channel or here on my website. Take care. <laughs>